want to read this quote uh, to you real quick before we jump into this. Socrates taught for 40 years. That's how long his, his teaching uh, career was. Plato taught for 50 years. Aristotle taught for 40 years. And Jesus taught for only three years. And when you just think about that, that only three years compared to all these other great minds that we've had throughout history, yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from these men who are among the greatest philosophers of all antiquity. Christ has had this amazing impact from the time, this short little period. Uh, at one time, and this is what we're gonna be looking at today, Larry King, the, the talk show host, he was asked, he's, uh, he was uh, raised Jewish, and he was asked once, if you could interview anyone in history, who would you interview and what would you ask them? And he said, I would interview Jesus Christ and I would ask him if he was really actually born of a virgin because to me, if that's true, that changes everything. That, that's, that's a very interesting insight. That if, if someone was actually born from a virgin, then we should pay attention to what he has to say, if that's really true. Because this isn't just some uh, marvel of nature, but it's a mystery of grace. But why did that happen? Not so much how did it happen, but why was a man born of a virgin? And, and as we prepare our hearts for Advent, we're gonna to start today by looking at this, this idea of, of the incarnation, uh, God becoming a man and, and why that's so important. Why was that necessary? So I wanna, um, I just want, I wanna pray and, and ask the Lord that he would uh, take us past sort of the, um, that, that initial uh, intellectual truth that we, we, we say that all the time, you know, born of a virgin, born of a virgin. And it's just kind of like a theological thing, we just kind of check off in our mind, like we know that, we believe that, but, but I wanna ask the Holy Spirit to show us why that is so critical, why that is so incredible, so marvelous, why, uh, why did it have to happen that way? Was there another way that God could have saved us? What is so important about that particular truth? So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to, to teach us that, to show us that, and to make that a reality that would deepen our worship this Christmas season. Father God, I confess that there are so many truths in your word that I just, I take for granted. I don't really think through the importance and the depth of what some of your, your great and, and many promises, what they mean. And I know that because I, I let those things kind of slip through the, the cracks and they just kind of sit up in my mind and they don't really uh, go down into my heart, I know that that's part of the reason why my mind does get distracted at times like Christmas. Because the, the marvel the awesomeness of, of what Christmas really is about, it, it doesn't have the, the forefront in my mind that it should. Uh, it gets reduced down to just images of a, of a nativity and, and a couple stories, and maybe we wait until December 24th to really think about it. And so Lord, we want that to be far from us. We want to uh, start even now, and we want to prepare room in our hearts, even as the, the Christmas carol, Joy of the World says, we're going to prepare him room in our hearts for this coming season. We don't want our hearts so filled with buying gifts and getting gifts that there's no room at the proverbial inn in our hearts. So God, help prepare us this morning as we uh, look at the, the depth, really, of, of what this thing called the incarnation is. So we thank you, Lord. We do love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
Well, first, I want to start just by defining uh, a term real quick, the word Advent. Uh, Advent just means arrival or coming or sometimes beginning. And so we're talking about the arrival of somebody. Someone is arriving, and that's what we're going to look at today is who, who is it and, and why is it him? So uh, what I want to do over the next four weeks, uh, there was a, a guy in uh, Luke chapter one, his name was Zechariah, and Zechariah uh, was a priest, and he was also the husband of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth and Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, uh, they were cousins. Now, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they uh, didn't have any kids, and they were old, and so she was uh, very, uh, she, she didn't, obviously she was ashamed of that, she didn't like that, she, she thought that it was uh, somehow a, uh, a sign of judgment, which it, it was not, uh, but, um, but for her, it was a really difficult thing to, to endure, and she was now advanced in her age. And they'd prayed for their whole life uh, that God would give them a child. And so uh, at one point, uh, Zechariah was uh, in the temple ministering and he was selected amongst his little, uh, the, the, like the little, uh, they have uh, different uh, sects of these uh, priests that would rotate. And he was chosen to go into the temple and burn incense and when he was in there, uh, an angel appeared. And this angel told him, I've heard your, uh, the Lord's heard your prayer and you're gonna bear a child. And he was amazed, and, but he started doubting. He goes, oh, that, that's not possible, I, we're, we're so old. And they said, no, uh, God told me to come to you and tell you it's gonna happen, but because you doubted, when you leave this room, you're not gonna be able to talk. So, so he left the room, and they, he was in there for a while, and all of his buddies, all the other priests were out there going like, man, what's taking the guy so long? He came out, he couldn't speak, he's starting to t- t- type of, like, sign things to them to let them know, like, you know, <laughs> you know, angel <laughs> doing like that probably. Who knows what he was doing? But, uh, but he's trying to tell them what happened and it says that they realized that he'd seen a vision. And the angel even told him that this, uh, this boy would be a, a messenger and he would uh, tell the world of a coming Messiah and his name would be, uh, the, the, his boy's name would be John. So uh, he went home and uh, doesn't say exactly how soon after, but they conceived. And, uh, and through the entire course of the pregnancy, he could not speak. He would have to sign things to everyone. Now, now keep in mind, uh, Zechariah was an old man who had been a priest for a very long time, so this was a man of integrity. Okay, this wasn't just some random guy who says, yeah, all of a sudden he can't speak, because then people would be like, man, the guy is just, he's just pulling our leg. This is a man, I mean, you try to picture, uh, say, a, a guy like Billy Graham or someone like that. Okay, this is not some guy who just came out of nowhere and says an angel appeared to me and now I can't talk. This is a man who's walked with integrity before the Lord for years, decades. So when he couldn't speak, everyone was like, whoa, something crazy happened. It's been nine months and he hasn't spoken and they got pregnant. And when the baby was born, normally they would have named him Zechariah but his wife said, no, his name is John. And then they were kind of amazed, like, why, why John? That's no one in your family's name is John. And so then they looked to him and he said, you know, he called for a tablet and he wrote down, his name is John. And so they said, then his name is John. And as soon as they named him John, he spoke. And what I wanna do over the next four weeks is look at Zechariah's prophecy, the words that came out of his mouth because Zechariah says uh, many things about the coming Messiah, but there's four things that we're gonna look at in particular over the next uh, four weeks that I wanted to really highlight to, to look and see who is this coming Messiah that is gonna arrive into our world. So let's open up to Luke chapter one. We're gonna be in verse 67. I'm gonna read through the entire prophecy and I'll, I'll kinda of highlight the different things he mentions and then we'll back up and look today at the incarnation. It says in verse 67, and his father, Zechariah, John's father, the baby's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied and he said this, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. And that's what we'll look at today, the fact that uh, God is going to visit us and redeem us. The Lord God of Israel has visited 
and redeemed his people. Because by this time, Mary had also become pregnant. So Jesus was in womb. And he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, meaning that he was gonna come from the family line of David, which both Mary and Joseph both had roots in David's family line. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, which will be next week, looking at Christ coming to save us from our enemies, and from the hand of all that hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, speaking of John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. And you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. John the Baptist would be a, a, a preacher. He would prepare people. He would go out and he would say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He'd prepare them and, and educate them about salvation that was coming. Because of the tender mercy, the forgiveness of sins, because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, and this will be the fourth week, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, this is speaking of John, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So here we have this this truth coming out of Zechariah's mouth that he's saying that uh, a, a, a man would be born that would visit us. Now this wasn't a new idea, this is actually a very old idea. So I wanna go back to the very beginning to see the very, really the first time that Christ was prophesied about in the Old Testament. So open up to Genesis chapter three, because I wanna, I wanna take you through a little journey of the thoughts and the minds of those who were Jews, what they were looking for, because they knew that a Messiah would come, but they were, we, we wanna see what they were looking for because we wanna know what we should be looking for. And so going all the way back to Genesis chapter three, this is after Adam and Eve had sinned, and instead of just judging them, which God very well could have, and just said, okay, you totally disobeyed me, so now I'm going to punish you. Instead, what he did is he made a promise to them. And in this promise, he told them that I'm gonna have a solution for this sin here. I'm just gonna read one verse, I won't read the whole uh, uh, curse here, but in Genesis 3.15, amidst this curse that he uh, proclaims on the man, the woman, on Satan himself, and on the earth, there's this little glimmer of hope. It, this is what we call the gospel, the good news. Good news amid bad news. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. So this is speaking to uh, Lucifer, to Satan. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Satan is gonna bruise the Messiah's heel. Okay, this is the cross. He's gonna do some damage but to Satan, his head will be bruised, meaning uh, Satan's will be a mortal wound that he will never recover from. But the Messiah will also be bruised, but not permanently, just his heel. Okay, so it's kind of poetic uh, wording that the Messiah will be injured, but not unto death, but Satan will be injured unto death. But here's the key here, is that between your offspring and her offspring, so uh, this woman is gonna have offspring this Messiah, this Redeemer, will be a human being. Now what's so interesting about this is that, is that even Job, now Job was the, the oldest, it's the oldest written book in the Bible. Okay, it's not the oldest story, obviously creation is the oldest story, but as far as uh, writing goes, Job is the oldest written story. So Job was a contemporary with Abraham, right around Abraham's time, so there was no written scriptures at this time. So all Job knew would be oral tradition just passed down. And, and, and I wanna show you what Job knew about this Messiah because it's remarkable that even without written scriptures uh, that Job knew this. In Job chapter 19, you can go there. And in verse 25 through 27, this is so incredible that Job says this. He says, 
I know that my Redeemer lives. Okay, no, no Bible, no scripture, no anything. But just oral tradition passed down from his father, his grandfather. I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last, in the end, at the end of time, he will stand. So, so he's gonna physically stand. This isn't just God in the air. This Redeemer will stand. So he knew he was a, a man that will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, so even after I die, yet in my own flesh, I'll see God. What's Job saying? I know that even after I die, my Redeemer's gonna raise me back. Job knew that even though death was imminent, he knew through this word that was given back in Genesis three, he believed that the Redeemer, even though Job will die, he believed that the Redeemer will resurrect Job from the grave. So he knew the gospel. He knew that God would send a Redeemer that would stand on the earth and raise us all up. Like, that's incredible to me, that Job knew very important details about the gospel. Yet in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. He's saying, no, not another body. I'm not gonna embody something else. It's not gonna be through reincarnation or anything else. With my own eyes, I will see the Redeemer stand on the earth. So he believed that this Redeemer would come, that he would be a man in the flesh, and he would see him, and he would stand on this earth. That to me is amazing. And he said, my heart faints within me. So this Redeemer will be a man. Uh, in Leviticus and in Numbers and in the book of Ruth, uh, there's this um, concept called the kinsman redeemer. It's, not a, a, it's kind of a, a vague uh, thing in the Old Testament, but what it, was, what it was was this. If you had land or something like that and you went bankrupt and you had to give over your land, well, over time, if you wanted to get your land back, the only way that you could get it back is if one of your blood relatives purchased the land and then gave it to you for free. You couldn't have your buddy do it. It had to be a blood relative. And this is the same exact thing. This is, and, and this was put in the Old Testament as a, a sign towards us being uh, redeeming not just our land, but our very souls. So all these little things that God puts in the Old Testament, they're all shadows pointing towards the Messiah. So for us, uh, it, we have lost our righteousness. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all uh, forfeited our eternal life. We've all rejected God at some point. We've, we've handed over the pink slip to the deed to our life and to our future, even to this earth that was given to us to, to rule over and have dominion over. We, we just we handed over, we went bankrupt spiritually. And the only way for it to be given back to us is if a blood relative can afford, that's the key, if a blood relative can afford to purchase back what's been lost and then give it to us freely because of his love for us. Because think of the kind of, how many of you guys have relatives that would buy back your house for you and give it to you for free? I mean, I'm sure your relatives love you, but do they love you that much? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but this is the key, is that you have to have a relative that, that has that much money and loves you that much to give it back to you and doesn't charge you, you know, rent or mortgage or anything. They just say, here you go, it's yours again. I know you lost it, but I, I bought it back. I know you even lost it because of your own stupidity. Right, like it wasn't like, oh, hard times, we lost our home. Like you did something stupid, you lost the house. That's what sin is. We've done something purposefully and, and stupidly, and yet there's some blood relative that will come to this earth and buy back what's been lost, giving it to us freely and not requiring anything in return. That's a kinsman redeemer. So, so this Messiah, this, this Redeemer, must be a human, blood relative, born of a woman, prophesied back in Genesis three, okay? 
So now let's, let's go back and let's start thinking through all the different people that have gone through Jewish history. And if you knew nothing about these, about the, the way the story ends, let's think of a few people that the Jews thought, there he is, Noah. Righteous before God, you know, it says that, uh, that he found grace in God's eyes amidst a world where all the intentions of man's heart were nothing but evil, and here was Noah. Wonderful, beautiful Noah. And he listened and he obeyed and he built this ark and it was amazing and his family went in and everyone died except for him. And now we're looking at going, here is the Messiah. Through him, we're gonna get rid of all the really terribly sinful people. We got this righteous man and he's gonna, he was given the same exact uh, command that Adam and Eve were when he came out of the ark. He said, be fruitful and fill the earth. Same exact thing, starting over. Here is the redeemer of mankind, but what did he do when he got off the boat? He got drunk and naked. He did read the story. I won't go into it, but it's, it's kind of weird, actually, what he did. But here we see even the most righteous man fails. He obeys God, he spends 100 years they lived a lot longer back then. He lived, spent 100 years with his family building this ark. That's, that's faithfulness, that's commitment. That they'd never seen rainfall before. So he said, yeah, water's gonna come out of the sky, you guys. They're like, yeah, right. 100 years, he just sticks with it. He's faithful, he loves God, but still filled with sin. So it wasn't him. Go down the line, you've got uh, Abraham. You know, all these great promises. I'm gonna uh, make a, a great family out of your name. But when God told him about having a baby, he, he, you know, he didn't believe. So, though he was a great guy, faithless. He was a liar. He lied twice about his wife because he didn't want his own hide to get skinned. He said, no, no, she's my sister. <laughs> right, because the Pharaoh wanted to take her but you know, if it was his wife, then he'd have Abraham killed so he could marry his wife. So he's, no, it's my sister. Okay, we won't kill you then. He lied twice about that. So here we got Abraham, he's, he's a liar. Uh, we have uh, uh, Joseph. Joseph, great guy, we don't, there's nothing actually negative said about Joseph, but we actually see, we have the hindsight to see that actually it wasn't even Joseph's line that Jesus would be born through. It would be his brother Judah's line. And so even though Joseph was a great guy and, and upstanding, and he saved Israel from, uh, from the famine, and actually, I mean, lots of amazing things that Joseph did for Israel, but yet it was not him either. You've got Moses, right? Moses led the people out of Egypt. But Moses, in his anger, he struck the rock in Egypt, and so because of that, God said, I'm not gonna let you even enter into the promised land. We also know that Moses was a murderer. He murdered an Egyptian. So even though Moses, we esteem Moses so much, but yet he was a sinful man. So you got Joseph, his successor. Oh, what did I say, Joseph? Joshua, sorry. You guys, you guys know if you're doing your kids' devotionals that we're in that story, so I got that one wrong. Joshua, his successor. Now Joshua bears the same name as Jesus. Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua, Yeshua. Okay, so Joshua is a really great picture of Christ himself. See, Moses, the law, only led the people up to the border of the promised land, but the law cannot bring you into the promised land, can it? Only Joshua, only Yeshua can bring you into the promised land. Only grace can do it. So Joshua, great picture of Jesus. Nothing negative is said about Joshua, but Joshua eventually dies. So he's not it because even Job knows that He's gonna stand on the earth in the end, and yet Joshua, dead in the grave, gone. And you have David. Oh, David, David's gotta be at the king. Actually, before even David, we have Saul. So the people now, they wanted a king. They didn't wanna just be led by God, they wanted a king. They wanted someone to look to, so they picked the most tall and handsome and, and just ferocious warrior of a guy, the guy that, he's gotta be the, the greatest king ever. So they picked Saul, so Sears Saul, Saul turns out to be a, a train wreck of a guy. 
All right, so then David comes. Now David's the guy, and like, oh, he's the songwriter, and he's the baby face, and he's total opposite of Saul, so maybe it's him. Let's just go opposite. We totally struck out on Saul. Let's go totally opposite. Maybe it's David. David's amazing. He's writing all these great songs, all this awesome stuff, and then he commits adultery and has uh, the, the woman's husband killed, one of his close friends, general in his army. I mean, premeditated murder. Crazy. And, and it's, the list goes on and on, and Israel's just waiting for a man to be born to save them. And, and they're right, thinking that a man would come to save them, but all along the way, they're getting it wrong because they're just simply looking to man. See, they missed something, that it, that it needed to be more than just a simple man, not just a divine man, but it needed to be God himself because all these men would fail. From Adam on, see, where Adam failed, we need what the word calls is a second Adam. We need an Adam, a man. Adam is actually the Hebrew word for man. So we need a second man, a second Adam that can fulfill what Adam failed to do and what every other Adam, every other man has failed to do. We need a second Adam. Something that's far greater than just a regular man to come and redeem us. Purchase back what's been lost. Now, I want you to look in your notes here. There's this kind of a tongue twistery statement that I have here. But we need to think through this. It says, only God could be our redeemer. Okay, only God could because only God is good enough. Only God can afford the payment that's, that needs to be paid that's been lost. So only God could do it, but God should not do it because God did not offend himself. God shouldn't be the redeemer because God isn't the one who lost everything. So though he's the only one that could be it, he should not be it. So you might have a friend who's not a relative that could pay back your debt, but they should not because they're not a blood relative. Only man should be the redeemer because it's man who broke the law it's man who forfeited everything, but man could not be our redeemer. Because as we've seen, every, even the best men, even Job, who God lauded as being uh, righteous and just amazing, even God himself, or Job himself said, I need a redeemer. Even though Job had upstanding character, that's why he was uh, picked to, to be tormented by Satan. But even Job admits that he needs a redeemer. So, so though man should be the redeemer, but man could not be the redeemer. So we have a problem. And in a sense, and I don't mean to, you know, don't take this like to the bank, but in a sense, God had his hands tied because he wants to save us, but he can't intervene because he didn't break his own law. So he's like, I, I can't do it for you. You gotta do it yourself. So there's a problem here. We need a solution. All these men have failed. I can't just do it for you. You gotta do it yourself. So, so God came up with a solution. And this is what we call the incarnation. Now an easy way to remember what incarnation means, uh, how many of you guys love carne asada? <laughs> All right. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, either you're lying or you haven't ever had it. <laughs> but carne just means meat, flesh, right? Uh, and, and incarnation, it's Latin. So a lot of our languages uh, come from Latin. If you know Latin, you'll actually kind of see a lot of things that make sense. Uh, and so incarnation means becoming flesh, becoming carne. So God became carne. That's not blasphemy, that's, that's serious. Like he really, that's what the word is in, in, in Latin. So God became flesh. He became meat and bones. Eternal God, who it says that we cannot see with our own eyes, became flesh and blood. He arrived, he came to us, he stooped down to us. I'd like to open up to John 1, and I want to just give you guys a great picture 
of what this means because, see, the Jews did not see this. They were just looking for a man, a divine righteous man. The thought that God would actually come and be the redeemer, but through a man, it was something they just did not see. And so John here in John 1, he's gonna make it very clear to the Jews because he's gonna refer to God as not just God, but he's gonna call God the Word. And the reason is this, is because the, in the Old Testament, whenever we talked about the Word of God, uh, the Word was not just words, a bunch of letters strewn together that describe things, but the Jews saw the Word as being God's power in action. Okay, so, so, so think about this real quick. When we talk about the Word going in our hearts, or when we talk about trusting the word, we're saying not just we're trusting in sentences about God, but we're trusting in God's power in action. The word is alive. It is not an inanimate book, but the word is living and powerful. It says that the, the word of his power, we saw in Colossians 2, upholds the entire universe. The word is God's action. It's his power in action. It is not just statements about God or stories about God or descriptions about God, but the word of God is God in action. It says back in Genesis one, God said, let there be light. And what happened? Something happened, right? Creation happened when God's word went forth because God's word is his power in action. Before God spoke, there was nothing. When he spoke words, something happened. So God's word is so much more than just words on a piece of paper or words that come out of a mouth, but it is when God decides he wants something, he speaks it. So the Jews would see God's word as being God himself and God in action. So let's look at John 1. John wants to clearly show his readers who this man is. John 1 Verse one, in the beginning was the word. So this word is eternal. And the word was with God, it's God's power. And the word was God. So the word is God himself. And he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. See, the word is, uh, is active. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was also life. So the word creates life. It is power in action. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Just like Zechariah's prophecy said. He was not the actual light, it wasn't, he's not the Messiah, but he came to bear witness about the light. And the true light, speaking of Jesus, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, to his own people. He came down he put flesh and bones on, like I put on my jacket this morning. He just, he put on flesh and bones, but we did not receive him. We didn't recognize him. He didn't look the way that we thought a redeemer would look. He wasn't powerful, he wasn't tall and good looking like Saul. He wasn't building a big boat like Noah was. He wasn't a, a, a glorious king like David was. He, he wasn't writing songs like David. He wasn't at the right hand of Pharaoh like Joseph was. But he came as a baby, born in a, a stable or a cave, a filthy manger, a trough to poor people. So we didn't receive him but to those who did receive him, because there were some during his ministry who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. 
those who are born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, not because two parents decided to have a baby, that's not how we're born again, we don't choose this, but by the will, not by the will of man, but of God's will. And in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's power in action became flesh. That when we think of Jesus, we have to think of him not just as a man or, or, or even uh, thinking of him as not just God in flesh, but that it, Jesus is God's power in action. God wanted something to happen And the only way God makes something happen is when he sends forth his word. And so for this to happen, for redemption to happen, for forgiveness to happen, for uh, for, uh, ransoming us, for that to happen, he sent forth his word, but not just spoken word, but his word in the form of flesh, in the form of humanity. That John Calvin says that Jesus didn't just put on flesh and bones, but also put on our emotions. He became us, the word, the power of God in action became human. A baby who had to be, had his diapers changed and had to be fed and was dependent on his own creation. He was helpless as a baby. He, he lived everything that, that we live. He, was, he endured temptation just like we do. He was sent forth, the power of God was sent forth to accomplish something. And in this case, he had to do it as a human. He had to do it as one of us. And we've seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is what Emmanuel means. God with us, the power of God in action, taking on human form, putting on skin and bones like clothing, humbling himself. I was talking to my kids last night, I said, and it's much wider than this, but I said, imagine boys, it'd be like becoming an ant and then having ants kill you, but you did it purposely so you could save ants. They're like, that's crazy, I'm like, I know. <laughs> and and that's, not even, that's not even a close comparison because the difference between us and ants is not the same as the difference between us and God. That is a much wider chasm, but it's about the best we can come up with. And the, that thought to be you know, crushed by other ants or whatever and doing that for ants. Like, I would never do that for ants. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, you know, when I was a kid, I used to burn ants with a magnifying glass. Like, I wouldn't go and, you know, send myself and become them and, to save them. And, and, but, and, and that is, that's not even the same as a holy God coming to save rebellious people. Ants never even did anything to me, and I still kill them. <laughs> Here's a quote uh, from a guy, Bruce Shelley. He said that Christianity is the only major religion to have as its central event the humiliation of its own God. I mean, do you realize that God coming and becoming one of his own creation, not having control over his own bowel movements as a baby and not being able to speak words, it is God set aside the glory of the throne that he sat on. He, He took the crown of glory that his father put on him, he set it aside so that he could come down to us so that we could crown him with the crown of thorns. He took all of his glory, he emptied himself of his glory, not of his power, Okay, but of his glory. And he humbled himself, came down, left that crown in heaven so that he could wear a crown of thorns. His father put this crown of glory on him because he's the the son of God, because he is God, and we put a crown of thorns on his head and pound it into his head. And he did this willfully. The purpose of Jesus being born was so that he could die. He came with the purpose to die. 
That was the plan from the beginning. It says in the word that Jesus was slain, he was killed from the foundations of the earth. The plan from before the earth was even created was that he would come to us, rebellious people, and die for us. The plan from the beginning before we were even made is that he would set aside his glory and clothe himself in humility and shame and the guilt of our sin so that we could crown him with our sin. And he did this, as John says, out of grace and truth and mercy. He set aside everything, as Matt said earlier, the safety of his own home in heaven so that he could come down to our treacherous, violence-filled home, subjected himself to our violence, our rejection, our sin, our treachery, our mockery. We plucked out his beard, we whipped him. The very one who made us, God's power in action. The word of God came to us and we sinned against him. But he did this knowing that this would happen. He did this purposefully so that he could redeem us, so that he could buy back what we forfeited. He came here to buy back what you and I have lost out of our own stupidity and selfishness as our kinsman redeemer, a blood relative, the seed of the woman in Genesis three. He came to us as one of us to redeem us because of his love for us. I wanna read this uh, quote from a guy named J.I. Packer. Packer's an amazing theologian, uh, old in his age now. There's a book called Knowing God, and he talks about the incarnation here. He says, the word had become flesh, a real human baby. He hadn't ceased to be God, he was no less God than before, but now he just had begun to be a man. He arrived now as a man. He was not now God minus some elements of his deity and his power, that's not what it was, but he was God plus all that he had made his own by taking manhood to himself. So now he is God plus human emotions and, and flesh and bones. He who made man was now learning what it felt like to be a man. That's that's amazing to me. That God was, because it says in in, in the gospels that he grew in wisdom, he grew in maturity, So, so he learned things as he went. Even though he's God, he was learning what it was like to be his own creation. That's, That's pretty amazing. He was learning what it felt like to be a man. He who made the angel, the very angel, Lucifer, who became the devil, okay? Jesus made Lucifer, but when he made him, he was still a you know, pure angel, he was a righteous angel. He who made the angel, Lucifer, who eventually became the devil, was now in a state, his human state, in which he could now be tempted by his own creation. See, because we know that God can't be tempted But now, as he became flesh, became one of us, now he's experiencing temptation for the first time. He never knew what that was like. The very angel that he created that eventually rebelled and became Satan, now he actually is tempting Jesus, God. He couldn't even avoid being tempted because he's human. And the perfection of his human life was achieved only by this conflict with the devil. That's what the word says is that he he was perfected through enduring this temptation. The epistle to the Hebrews, looking up to him in his ascended glory, draws great comfort from this fact. And here's what Hebrews says. He had to be made like his brothers in every way. This kinsman redeemer, God himself, had to become incarnate and become like us, his brothers and sisters, in every way. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, now he's able to help those who are being tempted. He knows what you're going through. He knows what it feels like to be you. 
He, he knows the despair. He knows the, uh, all the, the he, he, he put on our emotions. He relates with you. He's not a distant God who cannot relate to you. He became one of us. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. So let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's from Hebrews chapter two and Hebrews chapter four. If the resurrection of Christ is inarguably the most important event of human history, the incarnation of Christ is the most implausible. The resurrection is the most important for sure. But the way we got to the resurrection through God becoming a baby is so implausible. The fact that creator God would humble himself and shame himself and embarrass himself in front of the whole world of his creation by coming here, becoming a baby, and then being killed by us and crucified by us. That is so implausible. No other religion has that as its centerpiece. Almighty God humbling himself before his creation out of love when that almighty God could have just wiped us all out, but instead he came to redeem. He visited us, as Zechariah said. He visited, God himself visited us to redeem us. One final verse here, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Paul here says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, with his crown of glory, sitting on the throne, though he was rich, yet for your sake, for your benefit, for your joy, for your sake, he became poor. God, became poor for this purpose. You know, I love the small phrases, so that, circle so that, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Through his humbling, we will be exalted. We will be given crowns of glory. We will rule and reign with him in the coming kingdom. We will be, as Job said, raised from the grave, glorified. All of our sin purged out of us. We will live forever in an eternal state with our Redeemer. And we will stand with him on this earth, resurrected, and we will behold him, we will see him with our own eyes. As Job says, no, not the eyes of another, With my eyes, I will see the Redeemer stand upon this earth, even though my flesh will be destroyed by my own sin, by death itself, the result of my sin, yet I will see him with my own eyes. I will be redeemed by my Redeemer. And even though I put that crown of thorns on his head, he's gonna put a crown of glory on my head because he's my kinsman Redeemer because he's the second Adam who didn't fail like the first Adam did and all the other Adams did throughout history. He came and he accomplished what he came to do and that was to die for our sin. He was born so that he could die. God was born into this world so that he could die in this world. All because of his love for us, because he was filled with grace and truth and mercy. So as we go forward in this Advent season in December, we just we, we, we have to constantly reflect on these truths, say, God, thank you so much that you became poor so that I could become rich. And he wasn't talking about material richness. Those are temporary things that are gonna rot and, and just and rust and decay. 
We're talking about a much greater richness. The richness of God glorifying us and us being given back eternal life that we lost in the garden. And so we say thank you Jesus for fixing this problem that God could not in himself fix because we had to fix it for ourselves, but we couldn't so you became one of us and did it for us because of your love for us. What a crazy, implausible story this gospel thing is. That's why Paul calls in 1 Corinthians foolishness to those who don't believe. It's like that's just the craziest thing, God becoming a baby to save you, like no way. So I wanna pray and, and thank the Lord for, for all these things and, and just asking him to press into our hearts more and more this reality that he became poor so that we could become rich. Father God, I, God, just thinking through and picturing you and the Son of God and the Holy Spirit conferring with one another before the world was even created and coming up, devising this plan, this, this covenant of redemption. And of course, we can't picture what that looked like, but as you were conversing one with another and coming up with this plan and God the Son saying, I will do it. I will go. I will become one of our creation and I will let them reject me and I will let them kill me because I want to save them. And this reality that just comes to mind in thinking of Jesus hanging on the cross and saying out loud, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're crucifying their redeemer. They don't know that they're crucifying God himself. They don't know that they're crucifying the word made flesh. And it says in the word that Jesus, though he wasn't looking forward to the cross itself, but it said he looked forward with joy because of what the cross was going to accomplish. That he came to this earth with joy because he knew what his mission was and he accomplished it. God, I pray that through this next month, Lord, that you would just have our minds just attentive to people who are in need of hearing this good news. That you would impress on our hearts, friends, family, even strangers that need to hear the reality that God came to save them the reality that first and foremost, they need to be saved. That there's a problem in their life that they cannot fix on their own. Uh, God, use us as ministers of reconciliation as we go forward in our community, whether through these different uh, events we have or just in our lives. Let our speech be seasoned with salt. Let our hearts uh, have plenty of room to receive our King.